We're coming to a close to our series. All right, for the past couple of weeks, Pastor Keith has been talking and mentioning that the landing gear is coming out on the plane. We are getting ready to land. Well, today the landing gear is completely out. We are going down on the, on the runway real soon. Today we are going to be landing this plane, this series. This series has been the longest series that we have ever done in this church. For the past 22 weeks, counting this week, we've been in this series called Repeat, On Repeat. And this series has been covering Psalms 119. So it's fitting that it's the longest series that we've ever done because it is the longest chapter in the Bible that we've been doing this series on. And so what I want to do is just give a quick real, because I'm assuming not everyone in this room has been here for all 22 weeks. But I want to give a quick brief summary of Psalms 119. And, and don't worry, I'm not going to break down what we've been discussing the past 22 weeks because we ain't have enough time for that. But I'm just going to give you some basic information about Psalms 119. So the authorship, who wrote Psalms 119? To be completely honest, it's not completely, definitely sure, but most commentators and theologians accredit this psalm um, being written by David. Some believe it could have been written during Ezra and Nehemiah's period of time after David, but for the most part, it's widely accepted that David is the author. But it's not also not entirely important, because if it was, it would have been mentioned within the, in the psalm. But what is believed about this psalm is that no matter who wrote it, it was believed that it was written over an extended period of time. They don't believe whoever wrote it sat down in one sitting and was like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to write a really, really long psalm. That's not what their plan was or intention. This is something they believe was written over an extended period of time and compiled probably later on at some uh, later date. This is believed as a result of the fact that there is no direct current flow of thought necessarily in this psalm from section to section, right? There is an overall theme of this psalm, but between the first section, the second section, between verses, there's not always a constant direct flow of thought. So they believe it was written over an extended period of time. Um, it's actually explained in this way. The Enduring Word uh, Biblical Commentary describes it as this. The sections and verses are like a chain where one link is connected to the other. But like a, str like a string of pearls where each pearl has equal but independent value. So they're saying this psalm, as long as it is, is not like a chain where every link is connected, every link is together, every link just flows. It's more like a string of pearls which each pearl being independent in itself, but equal in value. So Psalms 119 is, an arrange, is arranged in an acrostic pattern, right? For those who don't know what acrostic is, acrostic is a poem or composition in which the first letter of each line of that poem or composition um, spells out a word, a message, or an alphabet. In the case of Psalms 119, the acrostic pattern is, is, is that this psalm is actually written out in the Hebrew alphabet, right? So each section, there is 22 sections within this psalm, and there are 22 letters within the Hebrew alphabet. Each section made up of eight verses, each section given the, a letter of the alphabet, and each line of each verse in that section starting with that letter. Now, if you open your Bible, you'll probably look right now and be like, I don't know what you're talking about, because that does not look like that. But yeah. obviously, it's translated in English, and that doesn't translate well, that kind of uh, pattern. And so if you were to look at it within its original Hebrew text, you would see the pattern of the acrostic, uh, the acrostic pattern. And so um, the overall theme of this psalm, right, which is very important to understand and know, the overall theme of this psalm is the glorification of God and his word. As a result, it refers to scripture over and over again, right? Hence, where we get our title from, on repeat. This psalm repeats itself over and over again by repeating the importance of God's law and his word and by glorifying him. The psalm, actually, I thought this was quite interesting, and you might not notice it right away unless you're looking for it, um, or that's just me, and maybe you would notice it right away. Um, but this psalm refers to scripture so much that 171 of the 176 verses mention scripture. 
that's clearly the theme. Like, if you don't get it after that point, I, I don't know how else to explain it. You, you can't repeat something that much and not mean be your main focus. And so this is accomplished by the use of eight basic Hebrew words that describe Scripture. I'm going to put it on the screen. I'm not going to try to pronounce it in Hebrew. I can, I can say Torah. I know that one. Um, but the rest you can see. But these words are law, word, judgments, testimonies, commandments, uh, statutes, precepts, and word again. And yes, word is on there twice, but it's two different Hebrew words with slight variation. Right? That's just how we translate it in English. Some of your translations might even have a different word for some of these in place. But they all, in its Hebrew, are referring to the law, the word, the scripture. Right? And so today we are going to be focusing on the last section of the Psalm, 119. Given the Hebrew letter of Tav, um, I don't have an image for you to show what it looks like. Uh, but it has a t sound. That's the sound this letter makes. Um, and it, it, this particular section is made up of uh, Psalms 169 through 176. So, little quick um, heads up before we get started. This isn't typically the type of um, sermon that I normally would preach. And what I mean by that is if you had the, uh, I don't know if I should say the privilege of hearing me preach, but if you've listened to me preach before, I tend to have my own kind of style. Like, everybody that preaches has their own style. We all know this, right? You listen to more than one person, you've seen more than one style of preaching. And so this doesn't normally fall in my style, but because of this scripture and because of this series and the way we're approaching it, I'm going to be bringing this down more in an exegetical kind of way. We're, we're going to break it down verse by verse and see what the psalmist is trying to say so we can comprehend what he's trying to say, right? And so little warning in that sense. There's going to be a lot of information given to you. Some of it might be simple. Some of it might be like, how did you get that from this? But we're going to dive in and we're going to try to understand and see what God has for us today. All right. So we're going to start reading through Psalms 119 verses 169 through 176. And I'm reading from the NIV. It will be on the screen if you would like to follow. May my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promise. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delight. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your law sustain me. I have strayed like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. Now let's break down these verses and really see what the psalmist is trying to say. So starting with 169. May my cry come before you, Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. In this verse, we see the word cry, right? In this verse, cry is the psalmist's expression of prayer, right? The psalmist here is he's crying out to God. He's praying to God. He is pleading with God, right? This isn't far-fetched from our understanding. Like, we've heard this terminology used in, when it represents prayer multiple times. We might have even said it to ourselves, I cry out to you, God, or something like that. This is something that we can kind of clearly see. But the question is, what is he praying for, right? The psalmist is praying for something. What is it he's praying for? He's praying for understanding, right? He's praying for understanding, but he's praying specifically for understanding according to God's word, right? This is, he's not praying for understanding in a humanistic kind of way, right? He's specifically praying, understanding according to God's word. What do I mean by humanistic way that he's not praying in that sense? What I mean by humanistic way or humanism is a humanistic way of thought is through science, reason, and logic, right? He's not asking God, give me, give me the science Give me the understanding that I find through science. Give me the understanding I find through reason and logic. That's not what he's asking. He's asking, God, give me the knowledge and understanding I need according to your word. The understanding that comes from your word. A humanistic way of understanding comes natural to us. Right? Why does that come natural? Because it's, it's self-focused. The humanistic point of view is inward focus. It's about our needs, our wants, our desires, our welfare. And so the psalmist is not, <clears throat> the psalmist is not asking God, <clears throat> sorry, for that, 
He's asking that God will transform what would be natural to him and his way of thinking. He's asking God, may you transform my mind and give me understanding that lines up and, and is according to your word. This is very familiar with a verse that we might be familiar with, found in Romans 12.2. The Apostle Paul says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, <clears throat> but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This is basically the same concept. Right? The psalmist is saying this hundreds of years before Paul. Paul's probably even getting this idea from th- verses such as this. Right? He's, the psalmist is like, Lord, I naturally think this way. My mind goes this way. When I view problems, when I view situations, when I view my own life, this is how I think. But God, I know this is not what your word wants from me. This is not what you desire of me. Your ways are not my ways. And so God, transform the way I view things. Transform the way I understand things and help it to align with your word. Thank you. And so the psalmist continues in verse 170. May my supplication come before you. Deliver me according to your promises. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have the best vocabulary. Like, I really don't. Um, And so when I read this verse and I see supplication, I'm being just real. I don't know what supplication means. When I read it, if I just read it and don't try to look up what this word is, I can assume what it means just based off of the context of this verse. But I personally didn't know. So I did the work of just quickly defining it just in case any of you in the room are the same as me and you're like, I don't know what supplication is, but whatever you say, just keep on going. So I'm going to give you the definition of supplication so we can understand what the psalmist is saying. Supplication is defined as this, the action of asking or begging for something earnestly or humbly. All right? The action of asking or begging for something earnestly and humbly. So pretty much, once again, he's kind of repeating himself, which is fitting for this series, repeat, right? He's praying again. He's praying to God. But this time, there's more earnestness to it. He's coming humbly to God, and he's praying. But what is he praying for? Once again, the psalmist is praying, and this time he is praying for deliverance according to God's promises. And in some of the translations that you may have, it'll translate promises to word. So according to his promises, according to his word. Now, what exactly does he need deliverance from is unknown. We, we don't know what the psalmist in this very moment is needing deliverance from, if it's something specific or if it's something general. But he wasn't specific. But what he is specific about is deliverance, right? He needs deliverance. And the psalmist is asking for a specific type of deliverance without being specific. And I know that statement literally makes no sense. And so I just need you to check with me for a second. He's asking for something specific, but he's not being specific. See, a deliverance that, the, the speci- what's specific about his deliverance is his, he wants a deliverance that's according to his promises, to God's promises and his word. So that means a deliverance that's consistent with God's revealed word and will. Right? That's what he's asking. So he's being specific. God, give me deliverance according to your will, what you have planned, what you desire. Specific. But what he's not doing is this. And I'm going to give a quick example. Put you, in the, put you in the place of the psalmist real quick. So let's just say you're in a financial situation. Things are tight. Money's tight. Money's slim. Bills are coming in. Right? You're stressing. You're sweating. You know, bills due on Friday. You're like, I don't know how this is going to happen. Right? And you see for foreseeable future, there's a lot more bills coming. And you're like, this is not working. I'm stressed. Oh, you remember a verse you heard. You say, oh, I remember that, that pastor. He, he said something from Philippians. I think it was like 419, right? And the verse says, God will provide all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. And so you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So God promised that he'll provide my need, right? If I'm living for him, I'm living for him and, and, and allowing him to move in my life. He's going to provide for my needs. So I am trusting that God's going to provide. And so you decide you're going to pray to God <clears throat> for that provision. And so you pray, trusting in that promise. And you say, God, give me a promotion at my job. Give me a promotion that has a substantial pay increase. 
Give me a promotion that maybe even just benefits my working environment. That would be a little plus. You know, I don't really like what I'm doing right now, but if it can be better, then awesome. But God, do that because that will solve my problem. Right? You end up in that type of prayer. You've been very specific to God, and ultimately you kind of planned it out for God already. In a prayer like that, you're saying, God, I know what I need most, and I know how you should provide best. And that will be with this promotion. Because with the promotion and a pay increase, I'll be able to afford these bills. And hey, my life will be better anyway. But that's not what the psalmist is doing. The psalmist isn't being specific on how he wants deliverance from whatever it is he needs deliverance from. He's saying, God, I need deliverance and I want it because you promise you'll give it whatever way you give it. Whenever you give it, however you give it, that's what I want. Not my way, but your way. I want the right and just deliverance, not an unrighteous or unwise deliverance. Does that make sense? That's what the psalmist is trying to to ask for. And so, now that we understand this, we're going to jump into the next verse. I'm kind of breaking these verses into pairs of two, right? So there's four sections here within this, because there's eight verses. And the reason why I'm breaking them into two is every pair of verses kind of flow in the same thought together. And so we're going to keep it there. So we're going to move to the next two verses. And uh, starting with 171. May my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. The psalmist's ability to praise the Lord is a direct result of learning God's word. That's what he's pretty much saying here. My lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. He is claiming that he will praise God because he knows how to. He knows how to. Because he learned how to through the word, right? That might seem like, well, how, how, why do you need to learn that? Like, how, how does that make sense? How does somebody need to be taught how to praise God? Isn't that something that we should just be able to do, right? But it's not necessarily that case. It is something that we are able to do. I don't think any of us need help in, in learning how to praise something, right, or worship something. Right? We were created to praise and worship. But we were created that way from the beginning. That's what God intent. But he created us to praise and worship him and him alone. The problem is sin entered us. And as a result of that sin and our sinful nature, we lost sight of how to do that properly. And so we don't struggle praising and worshiping. We just struggle praising and worshiping God. Right? I don't think any of us need to be taught on how to praise God. Um, or worship wealth, how to praise and worship our health, how to praise and worship entertainment, fame, and pleasure. I mean, some of you might be like, I don't praise and worship those things. But what is praise and worship in its essence? It's dedication, it's devotion, it's, it's, it's our attention. When we give our dedication, devotion, our attention, our heart, our life, and everything to something, that's praise and worship. And we do that, to be honest, especially here in our culture in America where you have so much, we do that on a daily basis. It's just not towards God. It's towards our job. It's towards our career. It's towards our our bank account. It's towards our entertainment, what what we search for when we get home. It's towards the pleasure, the things that make us happy and pleases us. We'll dedicate our life to it. We'll dedicate our money to it. We'll dedicate our time to it. And we praise and worship these things. But the problem with these things, as many of us know, is they're not perfect. They don't satisfy, right? Things, something new comes along. Something changes within us. So we, we're going from one thing to another, trying to find a thing that satisfies. But they don't. They never will, because we weren't created to praise and worship those things. We were created to praise and worship God and God alone. And the only way we are going to know that is through his word. Right? God's initial intent for us when he created heaven and earth and everything within it, when he created Adam, his initial intent was to have a relationship with us face to face every day. But sin separated us from that. And so our only understanding and knowing of this, of what God intended, is found in scripture. We don't know how to praise God unless we learn how to praise God. We don't know why to praise God until, unless we learn why we praise God. Because of who he is and what he's done and what he's doing and what he'll accomplish. Once we understand those things and know those things, we can praise him. 
Right? You can see this as an example um, in a new Christian's life, a new believer, right? They're excited. They just heard about Jesus. They accepted Jesus. And, and, and they're praising. And, there's, and it's awesome. It's actually some of the most amazing worship and praise you'll ever see because it's so genuine. But at the same time, it's so uh, just simple in a way. Not saying that praise and worship is something extremely complex. But what it is, is their, their, their worship sometimes is surface because they, they, they're excited. They know that they're, they're worshiping this God, but they don't know much about him yet. They're still learning. They don't know why he's so good. They just know he's good. They don't know why he's so amazing. They just know he's amazing. And it feels amazing, too, worshiping him. But you see that worship and the worship of somebody who's been living for the Lord generation after generation, somebody who's been in his word and knows him and has the heart of God. And when they praise and worship God, there's something so deep about it, something so real. When you see somebody that's been living for the Lord over 40 years and break down and crying because God has just moved in such a simple word in their heart, but it means so much because they understand his heart. Right? There's something different. There's nothing wrong about a genuine, real, fresh believer's praise and worship. It's really awesome and really encouraging. But you see it grow and mature as they grow and mature, and it becomes deeper and even more real. And they do that. Why? Because they learn his word, they understand him, and they know him by his word. And so the psalmist is telling us, may my lips overflow with praise, for you teach me your decrees. Because I know your word, my lips will overflow with praise. Now let's jump to the next verse. Psalms 172. May my tongue sing of your word, for all your commands are righteous. The psalmist will sing, or in other translations, they'll say speak, of God's word to others, because he believes, sees, and understands that what he has been taught through the word is right, true, honest, and pure. Right? So the psalmist is going to sing and speak the praises of God and of his word to others, because his commands are righteous. He understands and believes that God's scripture leads him when he learns it and understands it. His scripture will lead him to purity, righteousness, truth, and joy. God's word does not lead the psalmist to despair, pain, sorrow, and suffering. And he understands that. He understands that the word is going to bring him to a place of understanding of righteousness, truth, joy. And because of this, he is confident within his convictions that he finds in the word of God. So he will sing about it for all who will hear, and he will speak of it to all who will listen. Right? That's what the psalmist is mean. This, this particular verse is very face value right there. Not much deeper to go into that. So let's continue to the next two verses. Psalms 173. May your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. The psalmist feels bold enough to ask God for help. And obviously he's asking for God's help in times of need. Because he has chosen to follow God and his commands. God has commanded the psalmist through his word, A, B, or C, fill in the blank. Whatever it is that we find in God's word. The the psalmist has been commanded by God's word to live this way. The psalmist has been commanded by God's word to restrain from this. The psalmist has been convinced by God's word to do this, to do that, right? So the psalmist has been convinced and and, and believes in his commands uh, that he's found in the word. And the psalmist is choosing to obey and follow God's word. And he asks God then, with the confidence and boldness, he asks, when trouble comes, God, will you provide help? Will you provide guidance? Will you provide wisdom, strength, strength, and honestly, anything that I need? Why is the psalmist so bold in asking that? Because he knows that the God that will call is going to help. See, God doesn't call the psalmist to do something that's going to cause him to suffer, fall, and and, and ultimately fail. Right? No, God calls the psalmist to something that he wants the psalmist to be used in, to succeed in, to to be blessed in. Right? Right. And I'm not talking about blessed and, and, and succeed in like our concept of it. I'm talking about Bless and succeed in, in, in doing what God has called him to do and being blessed by God's joy, peace, and patience, right? And so the psalmist, because he knows that God has called him, he can be confident and bold to ask that God, when, it, when t- trouble comes, and let's be real, trouble comes all the time. Life is hard. Life is difficult. There's a lot. Sometimes it feels like there's a lot more downs than there are ups sometimes. And some of you might feel like your life has been a constant down. 
But if we're following what God has called us to do, then we can be assured, just like the psalmist is assured, that we can go to him for help. Charles Spurgeon is a uh, pastor and author from the 1800s. Some of you probably have heard his name. Maybe even read some of his stuff. Uh, well known across the Christian community amongst theologians and commentators. Um, in one of his sermons, he actually points to a similarity within this verse to a verse that many of us are probably a portion of scripture that many of us are familiar with. Right? He points to this verse and the similarities to um, uh, the disciples on the boat during a storm with Jesus walking on the water, right? found in Matthew. And so I, I know many of us probably are familiar with that. The, the scripture is found in Matthew 14, if you're wondering. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. I'm just going to paraphrase it for you. But let's see what the similarities that Charles Spurgeon is talking about. And so after Jesus had just performed the, the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, he tells the disciples to head off in the boat, go across the Sea of Galilee, meet him on the other side. He'll, he'll meet them there. Right? And so the disciples head off. And while they're going across, the storm rolls in. Right? And the storm gets wild. And the waves and the waters are rough. And the, the disciples become afraid for their life. And to top it off, they see something on the water. They're not really sure what it is. And it's like a, it looks like a man. And so they are afraid, they're afraid, oh my goodness, there's a storm and now there's a ghost. There's a ghost in the water. How could this get any worse? Jesus is who's on the water. Jesus is walking on the water and he sees them and he sees the storm and he sees the fear and he cries out to them, don't be afraid, it is me. It is Jesus, right? And so Peter, always being the first to speak, right? Still, still kind of fearful, stands up and, and calls out to Jesus, if it's really you, call me onto the water. And so Jesus does. He says, come. And so Peter, with a boldness of faith all of a sudden, takes a step out of the boat and he starts walking on water. It'd be a really cool story if that's where it ended. But it didn't, right? He steps on the water. A few steps later, he gets caught up and focused on the storm around him. And he becomes fearful again. And he takes his eyes off of Jesus. And he begins to sink. Who does he cry out to? Does he yell to the disciples, throw me up, up, up something? I need help. Does he just... Well, he probably did kind of struggle because, I mean, anybody would if they were, like, in the middle of a, a, a sea and, and it's stormy. But did he, did he just, like, give up and, like, well, well, I'm done now? What did he do? He cried out to the one that called him out of, the, out of the boat. He cries out to Jesus for help because he knew in that moment the only possible help he could get is from the one who called him in the first place. And that's the similarity that we see in this, in this particular verse in Psalms. As the psalmist is saying, God, because I've chosen to follow your word, when trouble comes, help. I need your help. Because I won't be able to do it without it. I need your wisdom, your guidance, and your strength. I cannot do it on my own. This is too much for me. And so now, understanding this, let's move to the next verse. 174. I long for your salvation, Lord, and your law gives me delight. The two statements of this verse go hand in hand. God's salvation is found and known through his word, right? Kind of like I said before, we, we, we know that our, our true salvation is found in Jesus. We know this from our understanding of what scripture has taught us, right? And through the scripture and through the Holy Spirit speaking to our heart, we know that. But the, but the psalmist's salvation, our salvation is found and known through God's word. We see this similar thought in 1 Peter 1. Uh, verses 22 through 23. Peter says this, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, the truth of what? God's word, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, you have been saved, been born again, not of perish, perib, perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. We're born again through the living, enduring word of God. And so it is natural for the psalmist to find delight in the law that saves him. Right? Now, I'm not saying law as in a list of rules. We're referring to law as in God's word. It's God's word, God's promises, God's truth of what he has accomplished for our understanding, what he has accomplished through Jesus on the cross. It's through that truth that we find our salvation. So it's quite easy to find delight in those words. Right? An example would be, 
Um, you go to Six Flags. You go on King Da Ka, world's tallest, fastest roller coaster. I don't know if any of you have been on it. I don't think it's that serious, actually, to be honest. Um, but it, I think it goes at like 400 something feet, but it shoots you off at like 128 miles per hour in three seconds, straight up, and then you go straight down, right? How does this make any sense to this particular verse? And what I'm trying to say is this. When you sit in that car, especially if you're in the front seat, which I've been, when they put that harness over you, I guarantee you find delight in that harness. Why? Because that is what's keeping you alive when you're on that roller coaster. If they were like, oh, forget it, we got rid of the harness, it's just an extra weight, you'll go faster this way, um, you'll be good. And then you go off, I'm pretty sure in that very moment you're going to be terrified if you even make it through. Right? You find delight in that thing that has saved you and is saving you. So it's easy for the psalmist to find delight in the law because that is where he's finding his salvation. Is in God's word and God's promise. So it's easy, even if it's difficult. Even if that harness doesn't fit you the way you want and it's super comfortable, you're still happy because it's keeping you alive. So let's finally enter into the final two verses of this uh, psalm, but not just the psalm, the final two verses of the whole series. Verse 175. Let me live that I may praise you, and may your laws sustain me. The psalmist recognizes within these verses that he needs both life from God, right? right? Let me live that I may praise you, and guidance from God's word. May your law sustain me, right? So the psalmist is recognizing I need life and I need guidance. And as a result of this understanding, now the psalmist is able and capable of building a healthy relationship with God, Right? Now that he understands that he needs life that is only given by God, and he needs understanding only found in his word, he now can take those two things together and develop a relationship that is healthy, pure, and what God intended to have with him. However, the psalmist also realizes in the following verse, which states, I have strayed like a lost sheep, seek your servant, for I have not forgotten your commands. He realizes in this verse that he's still a sinful man, with sinful tendencies, right? His salvation comes from God and God alone. He desires that relationship, but he understands there's still something in there. There's still some sinful tendencies that might lead him astray. He really realizes that in the past he has gone astray and that he is fully incapable of doing it again. And so he asks God to seek him out when he does. He says, God, I, I want this relationship I understand you give me the life, you give me the guidance to your words, and we're going to build a relationship. But God, I ask you, when I stray, and if I stray, may you seek me out. Right? And he uses, he doesn't just say, when I walk away, seek me out. He uses an analogy of straying, like a lost sheep. This analogy is something that we are probably all familiar with in Jesus' parable of the lost sheep, which is found in Luke 15, 3 through 7. Where Jesus says this in this parable. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and his neighbors all together and say, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that... In the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over the one sinner who repents than over the 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Right? This analogy of that lost sheep is very humbling, right? Why? Because sheep are not intelligent animals. A matter of fact, sheep are some of the dumbest animals. Right? If sheep are left to their own device, they will wander off. If the shepherd's and attention, the sheep will just wander off. And they'll keep going further and further. As long as they're finding grass to nibble on, because that's all they're concerned about, they'll keep on going further and further away from their safety and their shepherd. Right? Sheep are not like a pet dog. Right? Some of you might have a dog that might have ran away one time. And then like two hours later, they're at the front door, scratching at the door. And you're like, oh, wow. Okay, I thought we were going to have to go to the pound or something. Right? They're not like a pet dog that might find its way back after wandering off. A sheep will just keep going further and far, further, become more lost than it was in the beginning, right? 
The sheep can only be found when the shepherd decides to go and seek for it and find it. And so the psalmist uses this analogy, and it's very humbling, not just because it reflects the psalmist's potential of wandering away, but it's humbling because it shows the psalmist's absolute dependence on God. It's not even just the fact that, oh, I might wander away, but I'll find my way back, God, don't worry. He's like, no, God, I might wander away, and if you don't come after me, I don't know if I can get back. He's dependent on God. This is humbling. It's humbling because we just read 175 verses before this about glorifying God in his person and glorifying his word and how that changes us and how we grow and mature as believers and have relationship with him. He just said, hey, I understand now the life you give and the guidance you give, I now have a relationship with you. It's humbling because he's saying, but I know I still might wander. There's still something in me that might, I might wander, Lord. And if I do, I need you to seek me out because I can't trust in myself. I can't rely on myself. I can't do it on my, by myself. And so as the psalmist grows in understanding and knowledge of God's word, it doesn't make him spiritually independent. Right? Like I said, the theme of this scripture, this whole portion of scripture... Is, is, is the glorification of God's word and understanding it. And as the psalmist comes to a more understand, a further understanding, a deepening understanding of his word, it's not creating within the psalmist an independence from God. It's creating dependency on God. Right? The more he knows the word, it's not that he's saying, oh, I know now, so I'm good. God, I'm good. You can, you can work on somebody else. I, I got it covered now. I understand everything. No, it's the more he understands, he's like, wow, I need you more than I did yesterday. I can't do this on my own. God, I am so dependent on you. And I honestly believe this is the best way the psalmist could have ended this psalm. And I, I, I'll be honest with this. I didn't really have a formal way of ending the sermon today. Because I just couldn't. I, God wasn't putting anything on my heart in that moment. And so I'm just trusting that God is already working and speaking the hearts of those that need to be challenged by his word. And I believe that's the case. But what I do want to do as a kind of an ending, and see what God, how he leads the rest of this service, is this, um, the Enduring Word Biblical Commentary kind of sums up the end verse here in this particular way, and I just thought it, it said it better than I probably could have. And so, we put it on the screen, um, and you can play the music. The commentary says this, the psalm ends on the reminder that the power and greatness of God's word which we see throughout all of Psalms 119, right? That's all of Psalms 19. That's the theme. That's what it's showing. So we see that at the end, it's a reminder of the power and greatness of God's word does not rest only in its literary brilliance. Its greatness and glory is in fact that God comes to us and seeks us and through his, seeks us in and through his word. That's awesome. And that's what we need to know. I, I, know, I know there's a saying, and it makes some people within the faith cringe a little bit. They're kind of like, oh, don't say that because that's not true. Right? Be like, oh, I found Jesus. People don't like that. Why? Because he wasn't lost. How do you find something that wasn't lost? He's never moved. He's never changed. He wasn't hiding. He was right there. Jesus finds us. When we get into his word, he seeks us. You think you're going into his word seeking him? Yeah, you are. You're trying to seek him and understand him and know his character and what he desires for your life. But the reality is that when you enter his word, he's seeking you. He's trying to reveal himself to you. He wants you to know I'm here. I don't know what you're going through. I don't know your struggle. I don't know these things personally, but God does. And how are we going to hear from him and what he wants for our life and what he's trying to do? By going into his word. Some of us say, I don't know if God's speaking to me. I have no idea. I have no idea. I haven't heard from God. Well, have you been in his word? No. Well, how are you going to hear from him? That's where he speaks. That's where he seeks you out. I don't say this in a condemning kind of way. I say this in a challenging way because I'm, I'm not perfect at it either. 
Yeah, the, the pastor on the stage, the one who leads the youth, not perfect at it. I'm still working on it. God's still got plans for me too. But he is seeking me out every time I enter the word. That's what's so amazing. And I think that's what the psalmist wants us to understand. And we could be like, all right, well, the whole psalmist is talking about himself, right? How does it apply to me? Put yourself in the psalmist's position. Are you desiring God's word in that way? Are you hungry for it? Are you thirsty for it? Do you desire the understanding that only comes from his word? Do you desire the deliverance that can only be found in his word? Do you desire the life that, you, that he's called you to live that you will only know how to do if you enter into his word and find out what it looks like? Some of you might be saying, oh, I'm struggling with my relationship with God. There seems to be a disconnect. Let's look back at at that at Psalms 175, where it says there's a two-part thing in our relationship of healthy relationship with God, is understanding that our life is given by him and him alone, and that it's his word that guides us through that life. Are you allowing him to guide you? Are you allowing him to lead you? I think that's what the psalmist's heart is, not just for himself or anybody that will read it is for us to understand how important, how necessary it is for us to be in the God's word. And not just for some head knowledge that we can then become independent and be like, well, I got it. I got the knowledge I needed. No. So that we can understand that we so desperately need God the more we understand his word. We need him, one, to help us understand it. But once we do understand it through his help, We need him to deliver us, to guide us, to strengthen us, to provide for us, to do everything for us because we cannot do it in our own power. And so what I'll do as an ending is this. I'm not going to have an altar call or anything like that. We'll leave the song on for about five minutes and uh, give you time to kind of respond and inwardly check just speak with God right in your seat the awesome thing about God is he doesn't only meet with people here right it's a really cool thing it's part of my testimony I, in my testimony I was at a youth camp in 10th grade some my 10th grade summer year and I was being encouraged every time now I went to youth camp for my own reasons right there was it was a lot of fun and there was girls and so I went to youth camp for those reasons and while I was there, I had somebody encouraging me, but it wasn't a leader and it wasn't a pastor. It was one of my friends. And they were encouraging me, hey, come up to the altar, come up to the altar. Every time, youth camp, five days, altar call at least multiple times a day. Come up to the altar, come up to the altar. Uh, no, I'm good. I sat in the back. I was one of the losers. And I say losers because we look like losers because there's maybe like three people sitting and everybody else was at the altar. It's just like, why are you being so reluctant? Just get up and go. Like, so I felt like a loser. I'm sitting in the back, but I, I was like, whatever. That's not what I'm really here for. But something clicked in that moment. I think part of it was the fact that a peer of mine was encouraging me. It was so real to them that I was like, mm, I want to kind of know what this is kind of really about in that sense. But the thing is, I never went up to the altar that whole time. But God met me right in my seat and revealed himself to me in a way that changed my life forever. And so we're going to take five minutes. I'm going, to, I'm going to head in the back. Five minutes. Just respond to God. Let him speak to your heart. If you're challenged by this, be challenged because that's what God wants. He wants you to now be challenged and then go and make a difference.